So I'm very excited about the anointing. The more I study about it, the more it's amazing. I mean, I've already read this book, you know, that's why I decided to use it for our um, second semester. So, um, welcome. Welcome to the second semester. Um, I'm already getting excited for next year on miracles. That's great. I'm just like, the whole thing, I'm like, I want to hurry up and write it. But anyway, um, so uh, I was reading it again today. Man, there's some good stuff to discuss in here. So we're going to have a good time with that. So here's the format. Um, we're going to you know, do the, the instruction. And then um, we can either have like a quick break if you need it. And then we're going to go into just some discussion on the book. So if you have any questions as you read, like if anything comes up, like what does that mean? Or well, I'm not sure I agree with that. Whatever it is, make sure you write them down, please, so that you can bring them. Because if you're wondering, someone else might be wondering. And there's a couple things, um, well, actually one in the first two chapters that I didn't agree with. So we're going to discuss it. Uh, it doesn't mean I'm right, but I think it's worthy of discussion. And so let's just invite Holy Spirit in here. Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for your presence and your anointing. We ask that you come into this place right now. Flood us with your presence and your peace. Scriptures say that you teach us all truth and that the anointing teaches us. And I ask, Father, that as the words go forth, there's impartation of spirit and life. There's a transformation that comes by the renewing, <clears throat> by the renewing of the soul by the word of God. And Father, I pray also that the anointing within uh, be stirred up from these sessions that we learn exactly what it is, and I ask, Father, that we become skillful in the anointing. And I ask also that as we go through the lessons, any questions, any ideas, anything that people might have that's related that can further all of our understanding of the anointing, that those things and questions come up into our minds. Uh, so we just give this time to you, Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit have complete control in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we're going to start in Exodus 28, 41. So hopefully you got a Bible. And uh, you know how I like to do? I like to start with the very first. Um, uh, I like to start the very first place that anoint or anointing is used. Okay? So it's in Exodus 28, 41. I went over it a little bit on Friday, like I, like I said, you guys had a taste of what the semester is going to be like. Um, but we're going to go into a lot more depth, and you guys are really going to be excited. So as we start this class, I want all of you to uh, approach it with this understanding. You are already anointed within and without. Okay? So um, the purpose, really, of this class is, like we pray, to become skillful in the anointing and to recognize it when it's operating. But also, um, like, for example, you know, uh, we talked about the last time where I, I mentioned the lady that I prayed for her knee. I didn't feel anything. So we have to be aware that it's not always a feeling. Mm -hmm. and, and so whenever you, whenever you put God out there as the good news, He promises to back you up. Okay? And so the way that's done is by the anointing, and a lot of people don't trust the anointing. And we have to grow in our faith level so that whatever we're approaching, we have faith that when we pray, it's going to happen. So like we've talked about, start with headaches, move up to broken bones, cancer, stuff like that. You might already have faith for broken bones and cancer, you know. Um, so wherever you're at, just always be progressing. Now, in uh, this verse, let's just um, give you some context. This is the very first time Aaron and his sons, which were the priestly lines of the Levites, were well, means in, were going to be anointed for service. And it says, So you shall put them on Aaron your brother and on his sons with him. He's talking about sashes. You shall anoint them, consecrate them, and sanctify them that they may minister to me as priests. Now, we're going to go through each word that is in there because it's very important. And I discovered something I did not know when I was studying for this. Okay, so the word anoint. 
I want you to see that's associated with consecration and sanctification. They're two different words, and I'm going to tell you what they mean. But the minute you got born again, you have the anointing within you, so you're sanctified and consecrated. And then when you got baptized in the Holy Ghost, you're now anointed with power. So that also consecrates you and sanctifies you. Okay? So this tells us right here that the number one purpose for anointing is for ministry. Notice it was to God. Did y'all notice that? That they may minister to me. So when you're ministering to people, you're ministering to him. Yeah. Okay? And uh, that's like when he says, when you give a drink to one of these, you're giving me a drink. Yeah. Right? And so just always keep that in mind because I find people that minister, especially, and I don't know if any of you are like this, but I know some um, people in my life that a thank you and an acknowledgement is very important to them. Well, it's nice. I think everyone should honor one another by thanking and acknowledging them, but sometimes we don't. We just, it slips our mind. Like, have you ever been in a situation where someone did something for you and then two days later you're like, oh my gosh, and even say thank you. You know, so I've done that before. But here's the thing. The Lord was rarely thanked for anything that he did. And remember the ten lepers? One came back and thanked him. And he said, where's the other nine? You cannot minister and expect, number one, to get acceptance, thanksgiving, or honor from people. And then the Lord, he said, in fact, that could actually disqualify you for ministry because he said, if I was looking for your approval, you know what I mean, I wouldn't be truly from the Lord. I'm only doing what he tells me to do, and I'm approved by him. And he was approved by him by the signs and wonders that he did. That was his evidence. So just know that um, when you minister, it's to the Lord. And then when you do that, it also can help alleviate the idea of, I don't feel like it. Or it can alleviate the idea of, well, I don't know, you know, can I minister to them? I mean, all of the reasons why not to minister, when you can feel that tug coming at your heart to go minister, it's like the Lord is saying, please minister to me in this instance, you know. So, because I do the same thing. That's what I do. Yeah. So if you, like, feel like, don't do it, you have to push yourself to do it? Oh, absolutely. Um, now, That's what I've been doing. It's it's yeah. It's like, that. I don't want to do it, but that, that, that tells me I need to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, like, uh, well, our goal should actually be where we do it every single day. <laughs> you know what I mean? So what you guys are doing with the treasure hunts is very amazing because what it's doing is it's cultivating a practice of ministering. And I'm curious... Have any of you yet noticed, because I think you and Ramona and I have been doing the longest together, um, have y'all noticed any increased opportunities, or are you getting bolder? Like, have you noticed anything yet in doing regular treasure hunts? I'm just curious. I've definitely been getting bolder. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen her grow a lot. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I do it so much. I do it, at so work. I work. I do it everywhere. <laughs> so it's kind of common. Right. It is like it's mm -hmm. part of my nature now. Mm -hmm. Do you find more opportunities coming up? Or are, are you seeing more? Mm -hmm. Is your outlook change, you know, changed because of it? My outlook. Maybe just at work. Okay. I'm more open to share my, what I believe in. Right. And even when people see me, like, they, they can tell like I you know that I'm I believe in you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like they're more like cautious of how they talk or oh, how they yeah, that's, how, yeah, how that's they, interesting. You know, how they behave. Right. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Like I'll say when I'm like all like rude and you know that and before I see like gosh, oh, you know, I wanna fit in but I just don't fit in on that. Because I see what I see, I don't fit into the world right. anymore. Right. <laughs> so, like, that's a big thing too with me, like um I don't need other people's approval like I felt like I did before. Mm -hmm. um, Which is important in ministry. I'm doing what I'm doing, what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And then I, it's like also, I don't, 
I have better discernment now about people. Like the, the Lord straight up told me not to minister to certain people. And he'll do that. He's like, don't. And I'm like, okay. Because there's like, you know, in the Lord, when he went to the pool of Bethesda in John 5, where the angel would come and stir the waters, he didn't go to everybody in there. He went to the one who later betrayed him. But anyway, I'm still not over that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there will be times where the Lord will specifically say, do not minister to that person. And there's no telling why. Just, you know, don't. <laughs> you know, it's okay. But I just want you guys to know that ministry is to Him. He's the one that is um, guiding you. He's the one that has the most interest in what you're doing. And um, He's the one that will show you or speak to you exactly what to do. Now, the word anoint, it's a verb. And it means to smear and to rub with oil. <clears throat> and oil refers to the Holy Spirit um, in spite of what some people have tried to say. The oil does represent Holy Ghost and His anointing. And we'll see that as we go through this um, study. It's also used in association with a religious ceremony. And it reveals the sanctification of things or people for divine service. So, like, every house me and Mike have owned, um, we anoint it. You know, I'm sure you guys have done it, and the property. Um, I get that spray pan and just go around my property and mark it off and, uh, you know, anoint the house. And we'll do it every once in a while. And we've actually had uh, firsthand knowledge from a Satanist tell us that when they try to go and attack people in specific houses, the ones that are anointed... They cannot get in. It's like a light, um, even on the ceiling. They said, make you know, make sure you anoint the ceiling. Basically, that's, that's what they told us on the roof. So we'll like even throw oil up there. But they said, and then there's like angels that line the whole place. So that's what's happening when you anoint property. You can anoint things like I usually will anoint my jewelry because it's amazing. You can buy jewelry and it's got some you know uh, cuties. And um, so you can anoint things uh, and sanctify them and set them aside for purpose, for divine purpose. And then... Oh, so you can anoint your guitars and stuff? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it's most frequently that word used in the Old Testament for the anointing of kings, priests, and prophets. So that's all that can be anointed. But, of course, he talks about that in this book, so we'll get more detail. Now, consecrate. This is the one that blew me away. I was shocked because I'm like, why the heck does it say consecrate and sanctify? Isn't that the same thing? Okay, so consecrate was actually um, probably not the best word they picked in the English for it. It, um, like a lot of places where you see the word sanctify, it means consecrate in Hebrew, okay? But in this instance, it's a compound word. And it means fill with power, and fill with strength. Mm. Now that's good. And so basically, um, and, and, and like you can look at the, the definition in, you know, like a dictionary, and it means to declare or make something sacred, like a church building or whatever. But that's not what this word is talking about here. So in the Old Testament, not even in the New, does this idea come forth. Pre-Jesus, when they were anointed with oil, they were filled with the power and the strength to do the function they were called to. So that's why it's so important as believers to know your function. Because if you're trying to operate out of your function, you're not anointed. That's why there's a lot of pastors that run people, because they're not supposed to be doing that. They're anointed for businessmen. And then why a lot of businessmen aren't doing very well in the business community, because they're supposed to be pastors. So you have to make sure that you're in the proper function. And then also remember that all the areas of function, all Christians should be doing. Preaching, teaching, healing, and casting out devils. Every Christian should be doing that. So does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you have your main purpose for being on earth, and then all of us should be doing specific things. So fill with power, fill with strength. So what that means is the anointing is the Holy Spirit's presence in your life, and it empower, He empowers and strengthens you for service. Now, in Luke 24, 49... This is after the Lord had been raised from the dead. I 
to get into a little bit more of what that power is. Mmm, that's good, Cappuccino. $24.49. So he's already been, you know, resurrected. He's about to ascend. And then he says, uh, in verse 48, he says, you're witnesses of these things. Now, that's a legal term. You know, later you would hear the apostles say, we witnessed all this. We, we saw this. He says, behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Now, the promise is Holy Spirit. As we discussed last semester, when God told Abraham, in you all the nations will be blessed, Romans, I believe, chapter 4, ties in the fact that the blessing was Holy Spirit. Okay? So from the beginning, those that had an ear to hear recognized what that privilege and honor to be the firstborn in the line of Abraham meant, what it meant for those things to be passed, because what that meant is they would be the line of the future Messiah that would bring the promise of Holy Ghost. Because they knew that God was a three-part being. You know, they wrote Genesis for Pete's sake, where it said, let us make man our image, right? So what exactly does endued mean? It means to put on as a garment. And actually, this is kind of interesting, where it said that Gideon was, that the Holy Spirit came upon Gideon, the original language gives us the idea that the Holy Spirit clothed himself with Gideon. Like he did the work through Gideon. I mean, it's, it's a very interesting picture. So I'm not sure if that's what that means or if we're clothed or all of the above. <laughs> You're probably yeah. all of the above <laughs> since we're in within and without. So it means to put on as a garment. What are you putting on? Power. And that's the Greek word dunamis. It's where we get the word dynamite. Now I love this. We've talked about this before. But it means to be able. So to be able to do miracles. Okay? It means power, especially achieving power. So you get results. That's what power means. It also means strength. So we could say it's consecration, right? And it speaks of miraculous power, the power of signs and wonders, the power of working of miracles. But I love this one. This is amazing. The essential power, true nature, or reality of something. Uh, now, what that means is that we're literally clothed with the essence of Holy Ghost, the essence of who God is. Oh. Sorry, you guys need some caffeine or something before you come to class. I'm serious. <laughs> that amazes me. The very essence of God we are clothed with, okay? So you're literally smeared and rubbed by Holy Spirit with His essence his miracle working power, you're literally a walking miracle, and you have the achieving power and the ability to perform them by the anointing. Okay? Now, it also means authority and might and refers to abundance and wealth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of prosperity. So you're literally clothed with prosperity. Isn't that incredible? It is. So that's just, I mean, we're just like the first little bit here, okay? <laughs> so, I mean, I'm getting excited. Preach myself into Holy Ghost uh, intoxication. <laughs> I'll be like, when am I supposed to go after class? Oh, yeah. Okay. Then in Acts 1.8, um, we all know this one, but it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, Okay. And you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the uh, earth. Now, where it says you shall receive, again, bad translation. Let me tell you what it means in the Hebrew, or Greek, to actively take. Okay, so we picture I receive, Lord, mm -hmm. I receive. And that can be good. Yeah. But the idea is that you want it. You know what I mean? So you had 120 out of 500 disciples that ended up in that upper room. Where's the other 380? Where were they? Probably didn't feel like it. Well, I'll tell you just what you're describing now happened to us Friday, I believe, before even um, we went to the chapel off. I told Ramona, we have to do this. It's like something um, at the very end, I, t I told her, 
I just have a feeling that we have to really go against witchcraft. Mm -hmm. I could think of That's a good. lot of places um, <clears throat> just instantly that we could have gone mm -hmm. that I felt like there's a lot of practicing witchcraft. And I, I, I told Bob, I said, we just can't go home. We have to go. <laughs> we have to continue. And we didn't. I went and we parked ourselves in front of several little houses that we know that need that. Right. Yeah. Well, and, you know, um, the, the Lord himself, he said, the kingdom of God, uh, God has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so what's going to happen is, you know, you don't see soldiers lounging around in the midst no. of battle. No. You know, they might have brief rests. Like, for example, we watched 13 Hours last night, oh. bawled like a baby. I did. It was just, I'm actually very mad about it. I said, Mom, why are you so angry today? I said, I don't want to talk about it. Because that movie, it was very sad. But anyway, they, they had six guys holding off over a hundred people. That's what soldiers do. And the Lord said, it, one will put a thousand to flight, two, ten thousand. You know, so God doesn't need a lot to be very effective, right? But the reality is, what happened to those 380? Did, did they later get baptized in the Holy Ghost? Or did they just fall away? You know what I mean? So having that hunger and that attitude of no matter what, I'm going to go after this thing, is very, very important. And so uh, it means to actively take. So here is the statement I want you to, to hear. If you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're clothed with the power of the Holy Spirit, you're clothed with miracles, you're clothed with miraculous power, you're clothed with strength and might, you're clothed with authority because your power goes over all the power of the enemy, and you're clothed with wealth and abundance and the very essence of God. That's just on the outside. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, I would say that pretty much sums up consecration. So back to the um, Exodus 28, 41. for the ministry training, remember uh, David Lee speaking about an individual um, that would go with a Sunday gathering, um, that every, you know, Sunday it's about sin, you know, and he finally was like, you, know, you need to stop doing this. Well, I saw that individual at Walmart yesterday, and it was so much fun. So let me tell you, the reason I'm telling you this <clears throat> is so that you guys understand what Holy Spirit is showing us. Because... Guys, a lot of, the, you know, there's some churches that have been preaching this for a long time. You know, we're not the only ones. The new creation, who Christ is in you, and all this stuff. Um, I haven't yet found one here. There probably is a group of people, but I haven't found them yet. Anyway, so I saw this individual at Walmart, and he said, I, I have a question for you. And I said, okay. <laughs> and so I'm like, ugh. Yeah. And, uh, and he goes, you know, Shouldn't we as Christians, you know, like we view homosexuality and abortion and all this stuff as horrible, but then like selfishness and anger and all that stuff, like, aren't they the same? And I said, no. And he, you know, kind of looked at me, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, actually, I mean, the Bible caused, you know, homosexuality an abomination. And I said, but you know what's really bad? You know what really, like, God loathes? And he said, what? And I said, well, it's in Proverbs 6. Those that sow strife among brethren. Mm. Well, well, yeah. He said, but, you know, like, religion teaches, you know, that the backslider can come back. And, you know, we, we, need, to, we need to just recognize sin. I said, well, I don't know where you come from, but where I come from, my Bible says you preach Jesus. I don't preach sin. <laughs> I said, at the furnace, we don't preach sin. We preach Christ. That's what you do. I said, so actually, the old nature is dead. Y'all are all focusing on the old nature. What I do is I instruct people on the new nature that's in them so they can actually begin to look like them. And he's just staring at me like I grew horns. So then he said, he, he, he kind of paused, and then he said, well, uh, well, 
I mean, are there certain sins where you should be kicked out? And I said, yeah, you know what one of them is? And I kind of leaned in. I said, it's in 1 Corinthians 5 if you'd like to see the list. Mm -hmm. I said, but one of them is sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians 5? <laughs> you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah. <laughs> and, I said, <laughs> and I said, the next one is uh, drunkenness or party and things right? like that. And then the next one is abusive people. People are abusive. And I just kind of paused on that one. And I said, there's a couple more. You can read them. I said, yeah, so uh, those type of people, they should be kicked out of the congregation. Okay, well, I, you know, thank you. I, I better go. You go right ahead. And this is a person that, man, I wanted to get in the whole wolf thing. I just got, you know, but, um, but it is. It's like uh, people are God conscious. And, you know, what a lot of people want to do is they want to minimize their sin and not deal with it, right? And he kept throwing out grace. He said, well, you know, grace you know, covers, right? And I said, actually, grace is a divine influence of the Holy Spirit upon the heart of man that begins to show itself outwardly. That's the original Greek definition. So if the person that believes in grace thinks that it's an excuse to sin, they are in big time trouble. So yeah, I doubt he'll ask me any more questions. Because <laughs> he was shocked. But what we're learning, guys, is incredible. You know, Mom and Dad from the start taught me that I could minister. I didn't understand the, the inner workings of how that worked. I just knew that I could do it because they would just say, pray, and then, you know, it would work. But to be able to know how this stuff operates and be able to recognize what we've got on us and in us is so valuable. So what will happen, and you're going to see this as the age progresses, you're going to see those that have been learning this stuff take off and accelerate and they're going to be the Daniel 11 people that know their God and do mighty exploits but then you're going to find those who have refused to hear who have like do you know a lot of people will stay in a church because that's where grandma went and great grandma or they've got friends there that's idolatry if God is telling you to get out of a place you refuse to leave you are choosing that place above the Lord so people that refuse to bend to Holy Spirit we're actually going to find them falling away that's and the great apostasy that Paul talked about I'm glad that's how I felt because from the very beginning that we gave our lives to the Lord I knew I knew something was missing. I was empty of something. And I kept saying, well, why do I have to stay here? Because this is where I was born as a Christian. Right. It's like I feel like I'm stale. We're not going anyplace. We sit in the same place. Uh, sometimes you even get a dirty look if you took somebody's place that Sunday. That <laughs> right. were late. Joyce Meyer, and she I was at that. One, <laughs> one of her meetings. She actually watched two people fighting <laughs> each other over a chair and they finally both sat in that <laughs> chair oh, wow. they refused to bend and it is you know like um, one thing that really um blessed me is dr harfouche said that you, you will sometimes outgrow a church now if you can find an apostolic church that stays fresh in the anointing um you know that might be a lifetime situation but he said like a lot of churches they stop at a certain doctrine mm -hmm. and you know so event and, and we need them like for example faith christian they're a great baby's church they get, they get people born again. Um, they teach them some fundamentals. You know, I don't know of any of the other churches, but uh, one thing I liked about Livingstone when Pastor Darwin was doing it is he was very evangelistic. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> we need the restoration of the apostles, and that's going to happen. So some of the churches that are faithful to the call of God and what their role is, they're going to be joined into that apostolic movement and God moving his people. But I just am thankful of the things we're learning and the things that God um, is showing us because it, it's just amazing. Now, you know what I noticed yesterday, mm -hmm. Sherry, is that I was the first one that, that gave God the glory for Marvel being gone and what she did here on earth. But now that you're talking about all of this, I now realize that my little story was a little bit different to all, all the other ones because everyone focused on, oh, um, what a big loss, we lost her, this and that. Well, I had already said, to all of us in here, maybe it's a loss, but to her, it's victorious. So you had an internal perspective versus yeah. our loss. Because that's yeah. how they talked about, huh? And that helps a lot. You know, when my grandfather passed away, the reality of where he was was so real mm -hmm. that it actually took the sting of grief out a little yeah. bit. Well, yeah. actually quite a bit. Now, the word sanctify in uh, Exodus 28 means to set apart 
and to be holy. I like that. So you're already holy by who is in you. It means to dedicate and to declare holy or dedicated for divine service. So what this means, I want to point this out. The anointing is what made Aaron and his sons dedicated for divine service, not the law. Okay? And so the law of Moses could not make one holy. If that was the case, we wouldn't have needed the Lord. It was the anointing. That's what set them apart for the service. So all of the furnishings of Moses' tabernacle, all of the, the, the um, curtains, all of that stuff was anointed. Okay? So it was the whole dwelling place of God that was anointed for service. So are you guys. Okay? And that includes your body. So Christians that think the body's bad, they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> okay. Now, um, one of the things I found interesting is by God speaking, He can declare you holy. So that's interesting to me. Um, and like he would, de he declared the jubilee year, which was the fiftieth year, as holy. So he can literally speak holiness forth. So that's kind of neat. So if he says something's holy, the minute he speaks it, it's holy. So here's the crux of this first part. This tells us that when you're anointed, you're not relying on your own skill, but you're cultivating the anointing. You're becoming skillful in it. You're smeared and clothed in the Holy Spirit's essence, filled with his strength, and set apart for the ministry he has predetermined for you to function in. And you're holy because he is. Now, let's look at 1 Peter 1.13. We're going to pretty much stay here for the remainder. 1 Peter 1.13, we're going to read from verse 19. When I learned this <clears throat> last week, I was shocked. I saw something I'd never seen before, so I think you guys are going to get a kick out of it. 1 Peter 1.13 to 19. Okay, so he says, therefore, um, now it's kind of important to know what the therefore is, um, but basically they're talking about how their gospel came from God. They're witnesses of it. So he says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. You might want to mark that. Be sober. And rest your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's important. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he has called you is holy, you also be holy in all conduct. See where the door is in italics for some of you? That means it wasn't the original uh, manuscript. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, silver or gold, from your aimless concept, conduct by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now we're going to dissect this passage. Okay, so <clears throat> here's something that is very important to understand. The anointing will either prosper you as you cultivate relationship with Holy Spirit or it can be to your destruction. Now, the anointing, the way it can be for your destruction is if you use it for personal gain. Whenever people begin to minister in the anointing, what happens is favor and opportunity opens up. And because God's presence and power includes abundance, often it comes with financial increase. That's why Jude wrote about those that, you know, they were in ministry for gain, like Korah and Balaam and all them. So, um, it's not so much the anointing that destroys you, but the person that is anointed for ministry, if they don't continually allow Holy Spirit to do the renewing of the work, right, with the Word of God, that any of those areas that are dangerous areas can actually corrupt them. But I personally believe that you may not necessarily have to have an area that's a weakness. And the reason I say that is Lucifer was perfect in all his 
ways when the Lord created them, right? It was the anointing and it was the privilege he enjoyed that he began to think it was him. So God didn't create him with a heart that was evil. Okay? So as you grow in the anointing and as opportunity and increase and miracles and all these things begin to flow, you cannot ever think it's you. <laughs> That's the most important thing. You cannot ever think it is you. And so if you will always keep that in mind when you're anointing or when you're ministering, because I don't care how humble you are or meek, if you um, see dead people get raised, come on. You know, you, you have to have that um, humility of, Lord, I was just your vessel. And it's not a false humility. It's just, I. I just prayed and laid my hand. You are the one that did it. So that's very important. And there's this interesting passage where the Lord, and I don't remember where it was, but he was speaking to his disciples. And um, they were kind of like, well, what do we get for leaving everything? And he, and he said that, he, he told the story of a, a man that sent out his servant to do this and do that. And then when he showed up, he said, now fix me my meal. And he said, do you think the servant will be uh, commended for uh, doing what they were supposed to. I mean, that'll put you in your place when you read something like that. You know what I mean? So basically, don't think you're all that because you're simply doing what I said. Uh -huh. It was like Friday um, before worship. I was like, all right, Lord. I don't know if I'm by myself. I'm like, I can't do this without you. <laughs> okay, you know what? I already know. I can't do it. I already know what happens. Please don't. Please and like and like he, uh, it just was. And when we got done, I was like, "Thank you, that was beautiful. You did that was pretty cool." Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like I don't like him. I've heard some people say oh, you, know, you should always be nervous anytime you minister because that's a sign that you know depend on. That's bogus. Yeah, I'm rarely talk. nervous, um, but it's not because I'm confident in myself. The Holy Spirit, I'm comfortable <laughs> working with them in, in certain aspects. Now, if it's a new thing He's showing me. I can experience some nervousness. Um, so, you know, don't allow people to say weird things like that, but just recognize anything you do is because of Him. Mm -hmm. And um, also, um, know that a person can be anointed, but they might have to be removed from ministry if there's specific things. If they're teaching false doctrine, so that's a no-brainer, but you would think it would be, but actually today a lot of people leave false doctor, doctrine. And then if they refuse to uh, repent of specific sin, sins like greed, uh, sexual sin, and pride, um, they're not, they should be ministering. Um, now, you guys are going to love this on the gird up. That, that's such a weird <laughs> phrase, gird up. But let's look at the loins, gird up the loins, <laughs> never mind. It's pretty weird, but let's, let's see what it means. The, the word for gird up is only used here in 1 Peter. And I love this. It refers to the mind being held in constant preparation. That's neat. The mind being held in constant preparation. I'm going to let you guys write some of these things down. So we're going to pause a little bit because wait till I get to loins. <laughs> constant preparation? Yes, the mind being held in constant preparation. And it's amazing how, how the Lord, um, what, when you have that, that you're doing it because you're so great. Um, I didn't know Holy Spirit and I'm like that. But when I was in the praise team at the church, the very first church that I was born and raised, there was this beautiful young girl that God just anointed her voice. It was so angelic. But she got to the point where she was always being complimented. And she was that example mm -hmm. that, oh, her voice was beautiful and, and she could do it. And, and I could feel it. Because sometimes the other ones in the praise team, they wanted to learn something from me one person that I tell well show me that key or show me how to go higher or lower. She got to the point sometimes that she didn't want to. Mm -hmm. She would just ignore you. Mm -hmm. And one day just like I guess the Lord uh, showed me our Holy Spirit to have a good talk with her. Because mm -hmm. I knew that I needed to talk to her and to win her over. And I told her Alisama I says, you know, 
the Lord has given you such an angelic, beautiful voice, but don't think it's you. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it seems like you're taking that route because the Lord has a way of, of removing us. Mm -hmm. There's always somebody else that he's got. Oh, there always is. Mm -hmm. And exactly, that's exactly what happened. She got so snooty with everybody that um, um, uh, Bob had a dream uh, that she needed a chaperone to be around with her when they were out on a date. Mm -hmm. And um, and I said, would you like Bob to tell you about that dream? And she says, no, I don't want to hear it from him. I'd rather hear it from you. I said, but it wasn't my dream. So we went in and asked her mom, you know, do you, do you give us permission to talk to her? Because she wasn't, I think she was 18. Right. And she says, oh, absolutely. If, if Bob had a dream, um, I'm going to believe that, that he should. So um, she still wouldn't even talk to her. So I talked to her, and what, a month later, um, and God the wedding was on, she was that. already pregnant. Yeah, so. oh, that's, that's, that's sad. Well, and I have found that God will often give dreams right as a warning right before, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, yeah, um, I find with um, musicians and worshipers, um, there's two things that often hit them, pride and then also uh, deep insecurity. Um, so, you know, some people don't feel confident to move into certain aspects of worship. Others are so prideful in their gift that selfish ambition gets in the way. So, uh, I believe the reason for that is the enemy. I mean, he was in charge of worship in heaven before he fell. And so he likes to especially target, um, you know, praise and worship. In fact, when uh, Kent was a little guy, I said, don't make him flaky. Make him very <laughs> grounded and very practical because he's a musician. Mm -hmm. So if you're not careful, he'll be a weirdo. And I said, oh, don't you worry about that. <laughs> I mean, he's a weirdo, but not in a musician. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that's good. That's good stuff. Um, now, the loin. It refers to, uh, well, yeah, I'll go ahead and write down. Um, the lower region of the back, because we're going somewhere like this, I mean, like the longer, uh, the hips, and the organs of reproduction, which I mean, that's pretty, you know, so it's not for loins, but we're going to get to that for a second. It also, um, is the lower body is designed to carry and it's for strength and power. So like a lot of times when I'm training people, like let's say they're doing, you know, strict arm presses, if it if they get fatigued, I'll tell them use your legs to help get that weight up. Okay? Um, so it, power is from the lower body. Now, write this down for mind. It's thoughts, intellect, feelings and affections, and the most important definition is mode or pattern, I've actually used pattern, of thinking and feeling. Pattern? Mm-hmm. Pattern of thinking and, and, and feeling. So you see that your mind is referring to your soul, your mind, will, and your emotions. Okay? Now, this is what Peter's telling us. And I'm going to have you guys write this statement down. You might even meditate on it this next week. Peter is telling us to hold the innermost parts of your mind and then I put like a dash thoughts feelings and affections and I'll repeat it hold the innermost parts of your mind dash thoughts feelings and affections dash that reproduce see that's important mm -hmm. that reproduce in constant preparation 
That reproduce. Mm -hmm. That reproduce in constant yeah. preparation. of engagement in the kingdom. So hold the innermost parts of our minds, our thoughts, feelings, and affections that reproduce in constant preparation of engagement in the kingdom. In other words, don't let any negative, sinful thought begin to reproduce itself in your mind, leading to trouble. Because as the mind or as the heart goes, the, the, the man follows, and you also have that, you know, sin is conceived in the mind. You begin to think about it, and then before you know it, you're doing it. So the, the loins of your mind, that's the deepest areas of your thinking that reproduces uh, in your life. And so, uh, like a lot of times you can see people, the reason they're having a rough time in their life is their mind has been in these places that they begin to speak, and it's reproducing or creating, that's another word, it's creating the reality with which they've been meditating upon. Mm -hmm. And then you have, uh, this is in the notes in Colossians 1, 1 through 3. Uh, we want to keep our place in 1 Peter, but this just came to my mind. Colossians 1, or I'm sorry, Colossians 3, 1 through 3. If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind or direct your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So it literally means direct your affections, direct your feelings, direct your thoughts toward where Christ is. So that's a fun practice actually. Um, like you want to live that way, but you can also practice that by taking some moments in prayer and speaking in tongues. and using those theophanies. Remember we did that one of the things where you read of his appearances in the Bible, like Ezekiel 10, you've got Revelation 4, and you begin to meditate on what he looked like, the rainbow around his head, I mean all of that stuff. Okay, But the more you live from the reality that you're seated with him, the more effective you will be. <laughs> you know, the enemy will try to bring you earth troubles, you're like, I'm sorry, I don't dwell here. You might, but not me. You know, uh, I'm, you're under my feet. Whatever it is, when you minister, you've got to understand that you're not ministering as if you are down here. You're ministering from there down. And, and I'm very conscious of that when I minister because that was a revelation God gave me a long time ago that if you simply minister from the earthly realm, you're going to be in your flesh. You're going to say things that are not from me. But if you're recognizing where you're positioned in the heavenlies and that I'm there talking to you as well as, you know, uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, it, it lends itself to um, more power and authority. Because we're seated in heavenly places. The reason seated is so important is when, like, whenever Jesus taught his disciples, he sat down. It's a, to the, the Jewish person, it was a place of authority. It's a place that it is finished. And so you would see the teacher sitting. And, um, and so when you're seated, you, basically he's saying the authority you have is, you know, for sure. And so you're operating from that place. Okay? Now, Peter goes on to tell us to be sober and watchful and to rest our hope fully upon the grace that is brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, the word uh, hope we know is expectant desire. Okay, so I think that is a little better than our English concept of hope. But um, now we know that the grace um, uh, that is brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ is speaking of his second coming, but it also applies to us today. So, as I told you guys before, and even just talking about meeting, a, um, meeting that man at uh, Walmart, it's a divine influence upon the heart, and it begins to show itself outwardly. Let me give you some definitions of grace from IMI's module, Growing in Grace. This is incredible. Number one, grace and faith are God's power partners. Okay. Power partners? Mm -hmm. They're God's power partners. Now, this is neat. This is part of, number one, 
Um, if grace did not supply it, your faith cannot receive it. So um, that's important because a lot of people are expecting things from God that he doesn't need to do. You know, like, let me, huh? Say it again. Um, if grace did not supply it, your faith cannot receive it. Supply it, your faith cannot receive it. It had to have been paid for. And so, like, let's say, for example, a person just knows that a certain person's are going to be their husband. But, the, like, didn't uh, Dr. Robin talk about that? that There's this lady that just knew Dr. Christian was going to be her, you know, her husband. Well, God had other, you know, things in mind. And, uh, you know, and she, she really didn't want to marry him because he wasn't her type. <laughs> you know, so the whole nine yards. Um, but a lot of times we get presumptuous and we have an idea of something we want, and then we expect God to answer that. But um, you got you got to know what the word says. You got to have a, a, a very good idea of what He purchased. So you can never go wrong with He purchased your prosperity, your divine health, etc., etc., etc. You can't go wrong with that. So when you feel that you're getting a prophetic word from the Lord, um, you know, go for it. Go for it when you get a rainbow word. But if you are mistaken, don't expect it to get answered. <laughs> okay? You know what I mean? So if anything doesn't get answered, the disconnect is not him, it's us. Right? So that's very important. If you claim something he did not purchase, you are in presumption. Okay? Number two, grace has provided big things. Huge. We haven't even scratched the surface. <laughs> Sounded like Donald Trump. Huge. Huge. <laughs> Amazing. Wonderful. <laughs> New Yorkers. They're so funny. Grace has provided big things. Number three. I love this one. I'll sometimes quote it when I'm about to do something. I have no idea what I'm doing. Grace gives you the ability to do what you could not do. All right, this is a good one. Number four, I should have thought of this when I was talking to that individual. Grace does not cover sin. It removes it completely. Bam.